Good morning. We're glad to see everybody here this morning. We have visitors, and we're happy for that. And We have visitors from all the way from Missouri, and we're glad to have them with us this morning. Hope you're doing well. I know it's a really cold morning, but it's a pleasant time to be together in the things of the Lord. So let's study along together. We all probably remember that the Lord Jesus made comments about our love. He said, a new commandment I give you, uh, that you might love one another, just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. And the thing about the fact that love is more than emotion, it's a commanded thing. It is something that God has said we're to do. And while many of us think of it differently, you know, we think of love as sentiment and emotion, and I, I wouldn't deny at all that that's part of the process and everything, but uh, that's, that's the easier kind of love. That's the kind of love that you feel, and it's a natural feeling that is evoked from relationships and things like that. But um, love is different when it's a command. And it's different when it doesn't involve somebody that, you know, I'm close to or whatever, and I am commanded to love them. And it may not be, you know, what you consider to be your best friend or whatever. It's just you're supposed to love them. And so my question this morning is, how do I know that I'm obedient to that command? We talk about the commands of God, we're supposed to be baptized, we're supposed to repent, we're supposed to take the Lord's Supper, we're supposed to sing, you know, in spirit and truth, we're supposed to do all these things. This is a command, just like those. Jesus called it a command and he said, love one another. So how do I know if I'm obeying that command? Is it mere emotion or is it more to it than that? Let's talk about that this morning, think about that a little bit. Typically... When we talk about love, and, we're, and that's exactly right, but when we talk about love, we're talking about what do I do for somebody? Uh, am I doing the right things for them and towards them? Am I giving, you know, maybe to help somebody? Or am, am I being thoughtful and kind to people? That's legitimate to talk about love from that perspective. But in this lesson this morning, I'm going to approach it a little different, and I'm going to take 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but instead of looking at what we are to do, which is a legitimate study within itself, but we're going to look at what you're not supposed to do. What does love not do? How does love not act? This is just as important to understand as the other. How love will not act. And if you obey the Lord's command, what is it that you don't do? Well, this chapter is kind of divided into the do's and the don't do's. In, chapter first, uh, first, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about it that way. Let's just read that section together, talk about it. 1 Corinthians 13, we just need verses 4 through 6 here. Love, he says, is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag, and it's not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong that's been suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. Now, there were several things we just read out of that that love simply does not do. And let's start with the first one. That is, love does not act with jealousy. Love does not have a jealous bone in its body. And that's a hard thing for us as human beings. Love is not jealous, verse 4 says. The word there is zelo, and uh, whenever you find that in the Scripture, you kind of have to go to that context and figure out what's going on, because zealous and jealous, it's the same word. It's the same terminology, to be zealous and jealous. Because both of them suggest the idea of a boiling over, a boiling up. And sometimes when we're supposed to be on fire for the Lord and zealous about our work for the cause of Christ, that's the word that's used. And then other times it's describing a boiling over that's a jealousy on the inside. And so you have to look at the conduct. And here it's clearly used in the bad sense because it's, you know, love for God should result in great zeal for him and zeal for one another, but here it's saying love doesn't act that way, so it's got to be the bad kind of zealousness, which is a jealousy instead of a zeal in reality. 
It's the bad, hostile emotion based on a resentment. It, it's heated, it's boiling, all right, and it's connected with a, a degree of envy and, and hatred and anger and things like that. Love, we know, does not act this way. There's really two kinds of jealousy or envy. We need to think about this because probably most of us have been guilty of one or both. One type of jealousy covets. It covets what other people have. And it looks at what somebody else has and it becomes jealous about it. And it may be that somebody possesses something you don't have or they're honored in some way or complimented maybe in some way that you weren't. Or it, it could be their status in life. Maybe they have things, you know, and are in a position in life that you don't have. It could be 101 different things. But the bottom line is that they, they simply have something that you don't have and you maybe wish that you have, and it's not content. You are not content with what you have because you see what they have. Now, that's one form of it. But really, there's another form that's even worse, and that is, I not only am jealous because you have it, I not only am jealous because you've got something I don't have, but I'm really put out that you've got it. I'm kind of against you because you have that. I grudge the fact that you get to have it and I don't. In other words, I feel badly towards you. I feel hateful towards you because you possess something, whether it's a quality or an honor or a possession, whatever it may be, you possess something I do not. And all of this is the opposite of a good attitude in the sight of God. By contrast, all of this love rejoices and is happy. If somebody else has something, it can be happy for them. You know, when it says to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. And most Christians are great with the weeping process. They're fine. You know, if they see somebody else sad, they, they want to be sad with them. But some people have a really hard time. If they see somebody having something good, they can't rejoice with those that rejoice. You know, if others have something better than you, if they prosper when you don't, if uh, their family seems happy, and yours is maybe torn apart or having problems. If they achieve something, and you're not able to achieve that. If they win when you lose. The real question is, because all of that happens in life, the real question is, are you going to be able to walk away from that and not be bitter at them about it? You're going to be able to look at their situation and say, I'm fine with that. I'm glad that, I'm glad that they achieved. I'm glad that they have that. I'm proud for them in that regard. Or is there a feeling in your heart that I really don't like that? You see, that's where love has to come in. We have to work. That's why it's a command. Because that's not easy to do. That's a situation where we really have a struggle sometime in our hearts. Love, we're told also, at the same verse, doesn't boast or brag about what we have or what we are. It doesn't walk around with conceit. And we're going to get to arrogance in a minute. But it doesn't go around, but the boastfulness part is the idea that we don't go around telling others or bragging to others, parading our accomplishments before them in such a way as to call attention to ourselves and make a big deal about ourselves, make ourselves look great in their eyes. That's not what being a Christian is all about. Christian love, the King James Version puts it this way, most of us probably don't even know what that means. It says it doesn't vaunt itself. Love is a vaunt itself. What does that mean? Well, vaunt it comes from a Latin word, which is the Latin word for vain, vainus. And it means a vain display. It, it's uh, somehow or another trying to display my quality is what I've got, maybe my possessions or whatever. To display all of that, to suggest that makes me superior in some way over you. Or that it, you know, I've got this and others don't. That's a vain display. That's a braggart. That's boasting of yourself. A number of years ago, we had a lady that was a sort of a family friend. She came to visit us, and she really wasn't here to stay with us, but before it was all over, she wound up staying with us. And I, I thought I was, I thought by Monday morning, I would have to put Carolyn in the hospital. 
because I mean from Friday afternoon to Monday morning we heard nothing except what she had and I mean she had brought some of this stuff and she would open up her suitcase and she would go over every piece of jewelry that she owned and she would talk to you about what she does really well and all of this and it just went on and on and you know you finally I mean you're proud for her you're glad for her but after a while you just like to pull your hair out it just drove you nuts there's too much of it that kind of thing doesn't go over well and it doesn't represent love as the Bible talks about it and probably behind that is the next statement that is love is not arrogant Love's not all full of itself. The very word, arrogant, there suggests the idea of something that's puffed up, swollen up, bloated. Love is not blown up. You know where it's bloated? It's up here. It's your head. You're bloated with your own self-significance. It's a conceit. And Look, you know, I'm, I'm not down on acknowledging in your heart and mind that you have some ability. If you, one of you ladies is highly talented at, you know, cooking pies or whatever. I'm proud for you. I think that's a great talent to have. And, and on top of that, you know, it's not wrong to know that in your heart that what you produce is relatively good. That's okay. But you can get to a point where you overestimate yourself, your importance, your abilities, your achievements, all of these things. You can kind of get out of hand on that. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes. That's an arrogant trait, in other words. He says there's more hope for a fool than him. And anybody that knows the Proverbs know, boy, he steps all over the fools in the book of Proverbs. But he says an arrogant man is worse than a fool. He, he's, in better, he's in worse shape than a fool is. We just have to keep in mind that's a dangerous situation to be in. Arrogance is a terrible thing to be afflicted with. I'll tell you one, one church or so-called Christian thing that can put us in a bad way. And it's this passage right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He reminds us, because here's the very thing we're all trying to get to, and that is a good knowledge of God's Word. Yet there's a danger there. And the danger doesn't mean you ought to be ignorant or you ought not to try to achieve a good knowledge, but one of the worst things that can happen sometime when you get well versed in the scripture is you can turn into a know-it-all and you can turn into somebody that you feel superior to everybody else because I know. I have knowledge, they do not. I'm above and over them. Well, just be careful about that. I don't doubt for a minute all of us need knowledge and a good knowledge of God's word. But Paul states it this way at verse 1. He says, we know that we all have knowledge. We know that we all, you know, have possessed this knowledge of God's Word. He bragged on the Corinthians and said, you, you're very knowledgeable people. But he had to get on to him. He said, but knowledge, sometimes that makes you arrogant. It can, when we get to thinking, that means I'm above all others because I have all this knowledge and all this wisdom and everything. Just remember, what does love do? Knowledge can make you arrogant sometimes, but what, if you love, what's going to happen? Love's going to edify. And I'll tell you what, to be edified any day is better than to be a know-it-all. Or somebody who feels like they've got all the answers in life. It's not that we want people to be ignorant, but if that's what knowledge, if knowledge is going to make me you know, stick my nose in the air and feel superior, then it's failed. It, matter of fact, hasn't accomplished at all what God wants it to. Love will be busy, because you understand the word edify. Love going to be busy trying to build each other up. In other words, how about taking that knowledge and put it to good use? Instead of knowledge meaning I'm really smart or I'm really bright or I really have studied so much more than you. Instead of that, how about using that knowledge to try to lift people up, to help them grow stronger, to build up one another. That's what edify means. To build each other up instead of of thinking that somehow or another puts me on a higher plane out here. You know, James deals with this, and if you've got your Bible out, you might like to turn over there. James chapter 3 deals with this particular topic, and it deals with this problem. We'll read verses 13 through 17. It's a passage, it's a, it's a chapter about teachers and teaching and what kind of teachers we ought to be. 
But it says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, in, uh, behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So how would I know that I am wise? How would I know that I have good understanding of God's word? James says, well, it ought to be able to be seen in your life. You ought to be able to look at you, and what would I find? Some arrogant, uh, foolish, pop-off, you know, braggart? No, you'd find somebody who's gentle in his wisdom. If you have bitter jealousy, if you're selfishly ambitious in your heart, he said, that's arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Don't lie against the truth. You, your conduct would be denying the very thing you stand for. How are you going to tell people if you're bitter and jealous and selfishly ambitious and want all these things in your heart for yourself and want lots of attention, want everybody to brag on who you are and what you are and all the rest, if that's your goal, if that's what you want, how do you turn around and preach Jesus Christ in his humility, in his self-sacrifice, in his attitude that looked at others and put himself low. How do you preach him when you're not that way? You lie against the truth. Verse 15, this wisdom he tells us. You really almost need to put quotation marks around that word wisdom there. That wisdom, this wisdom, what you think is wisdom here that acts this way, that wisdom doesn't come down from above. That wisdom is earthly and natural. And boy, he really trounces them in the last word, and it's demonic. It's earthly. That is, it's not heavenly wisdom. It's earthly. It's natural. It's oriented to the flesh. And it's outsourced by demons. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there's disorder and every evil thing. The wisdom that comes from above, what does it look like? It's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's reasonable, it's full of mercy, it's full of good fruits, it's unwavering, it's without hypocrisy. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those that make peace. That's God's kind of wisdom. That's what it's all about. And so you can see in that course of things that love doesn't act with that kind of arrogance. Love acts with humility and gentleness and patience and love and things like that. Love also, love doesn't act unbecomingly. What does that mean? Well, love doesn't act unlovely, ugly, indecent, unseemly, ill-mannered, rude. It's not love. If I'm practicing it, I'm failing in this department. Look, I try to be on the lookout every once in a while for a halfway decent coat to wear or suit or whatever. And I am a bargain shopper, there's no question about it. Uh, I watch for deals. The first most important rule of finding a new coat to wear because I like to vary them a little bit, because I don't want you to have to look at the same old thing. You got already stuck with the same old face every week. But, it, you know, it'd be nice to change out the coat every once in a while. Okay, the first rule is good price. Good price. Mark down on the clearance shelf. Second rule, got to look good. What, why you want a coat if you pay 25, 30 bucks for a coat and it looks ugly? Why would you want it? There's no, there's no point in that. So it's got to look good. Rule number three, got to look good to Carolyn. She's the third. See, see, that way I bounce it off of somebody else, and she has to tell me it looks good. Because I've gone, and I've looked, and I've said, that looks good. And I, she came around and said, well, no, not really. And I trust her taste, and I always have trusted it to help me out. But see, to me, in our lives, we live out our lives and we wear certain things, not clothing, but attitudes and actions and spirits about us. In life, it's more than just about, you know, how much does it cost? That's maybe not even that important to what we're thinking about here. What matters is, is it unseemly? Is it unbecoming? Because that terminology, unseemly, unbecoming, 
basically conveys just what I'm talking about. Maybe a good deal, but it just doesn't look good on you. It doesn't look right. I can't be a good Christian and behave unseemingly. It's just some things that don't look good on a Christian. You, know, you can put clothing in that category too, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what he's talking about. I'm sorry. I know we all get temperamental. I know we all get aggravated sometime, but rudeness never looks good on a Christian. It just doesn't look good. Arrogance doesn't look good on a Christian. Loose lips that use vulgarity, it looks horrible on a Christian. And we may not think these are all big deals, but they're big deals because they don't fit what we are. They don't look like us. It's not a good fit. And it's important to recognize that and and understand why those things won't work. And there's several times, you know, that when Paul writes, he said, this is unworthy of a Christian. This is conduct that doesn't fit what being a saint really is all about. So let's keep that in mind. Then another thing he says that love doesn't do, love doesn't seek its own. I I guess that could be interpreted multiple ways. That's at verse 5 there. But seeking its own suggests the idea that this person is always on the lookout for their own self-interest, their pleasure, their profit, their rights, their honor, but that's what matters to them. And admittedly, all of us have some of that, but real love has to do a lot of thinking and push itself to do a lot of thinking about others beyond itself. Now, it hasn't been long at all ago that we read and studied at length this text in Philippians. But I want to reread it because it fits this point so well. But he says, and this, by the way, I don't think he even mentions the word love, but it mentions the idea of seeking your own. He said, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. That's just exactly the point. Have this attitude in yourself which also was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. He taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So what Paul is saying is, and and the main point for our discussion this morning is, the kind of attitude Jesus had is that I am not going to push my personal interests. He, He talked about the fact, I didn't come to be served. We all understand we're supposed to serve him, and men that bowed down to him were welcome, but the point being, that's not why he came. He didn't come to be served, he came to serve. That was his attitude. Love doesn't seek its own. It's too easy to be all wrapped up in what you want, what you like, what you need, all of this. You have to get your mind off of that and get it on, on others, get it on God, get it on the, the uh, responsibilities I have in this life. But what he told us in the verses prior was don't just look out for your own personal interest. You can't think that way about it. Love does not seek its own. It doesn't act that way. Love, he tells us, is not provoked. Some versions say easily provoked, but the word easily isn't in the text. It's just flat out love. It's not provoked. Love, and probably we're all going to get in trouble on this point, love does not let itself get irritated, incited, angered. Love just doesn't act that way. It's a good test to see ourselves and see what we're doing. Am I getting irritated? Am I getting incited? Am I getting angered? Well, that ought to be like a police light flashing or a a, a fire truck light flashing. It ought to be saying to us, something's wrong here. My spirituality is going downhill. I'm not in control because I'm not loving as God commands me to love. Love does not do this. It doesn't matter. You can say, well, uh, you know, I try to be that kind of person up here at church. Are you that kind of person in your home? You act that way at home. So, well, I, you know, I have to kind of watch myself at, at, when I'm at work because I, I might get in trouble if I lost my temper. 
What about other relationships of life? Love doesn't let itself, it's just about love. It's not about where you're at or what you find yourself in at the moment. It's just the way it is. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says, don't be eager. That is, don't, don't be too quick in your heart to get angry. Anger resides in the bosom of fools. Anger's lodged in the heart of a fool. It, it's there and it's going to explode. It's going to lead you to do something ridiculous, stupid, something that's going to hurt you before it's all over. Love doesn't take account a wrong suffered. We're all probably famous for this. But it, it suggests the idea we don't keep a record. Okay, you did that to me one time. You, I'm not going to keep a record, a mental or physical or whatever, of what somebody did to me. I'm not going to automatically assume that the worst is true. You said something to me. It could be taken two different ways. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt there. I'm not going to automatically take the worst possible explanation of that. I'm not going to dwell on all the things that have ever been done to me in the past. Now when I say I'm not going to do this, keep in mind, <laughs> I have done this before. And probably you have too, haven't you? You've dwelt on the hurtful things of the past. He says, don't. Don't waste your time. Don't take account of a wrong suffered. You know, we raise families, our children, our children sometimes do things as when they're young and hurts us and it saddens us and all the rest. That goes on. But you know, we all look at that and we love them and they're our family and we shrug it off and move on, don't we? We don't hate them. We don't lose our love for them. We just acknowledge it hurt us and then we get on with the family life and all the rest. That's just how it has to be in life. We, we extend that because we do love them. And that's the way we feel about it. Look, love, and this is our last point this morning, love does not rejoice in iniquity. I believe, and it's kind of sad because I might have to quit pretty quick here, but I believe this is the most unclear point about love that people have. Because a lot of people believe in our day and time that love means I accept your sinful conduct. I accept and I will tolerate your sinful conduct. That I am supposed to do that, that that's the right thing to do, that that's the you know, human thing to do or whatever. And as very often people get it wrong, this is not love. Love does not accept and tolerate and endorse sinful conduct. Love does not rejoice when people are practicing iniquity. Love can forgive. Love can, you know, go on doing good to them. But love doesn't say, it's okay. I have to endorse you because you're doing wrong. I have to endorse it. Love doesn't do that. Love can never rejoice in a wicked behavior. I believe you can love the sinner. I think Jesus did. But I don't think you can ever love the sin. And I think we always ought to be careful that we know the difference between that. And that we can separate in our minds and be as clear as we know how to be that this is wrong and I will never endorse you in that sin. And I will love you, and I will do for you, and I will care for you, and I will help you. Even if you were my enemy, I will do that, but I'm not going to say you're okay in your sin. And we let family sentiments and emotions and all the rest get in the way, and we can't afford to do this. We've got to be clear, wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter whether my child or my family member or whoever does it, it's just plain wrong and that's the way it is and that's the way we have to treat it to be loyal to God but we need to be clear about that and understand that well because I think even members of the church have grown weak about this I think we've gotten in the spirit of the age thinking that we have to endorse everything we don't we have to stand with Jesus and we have to say it's wrong and we've got to that we're doing it 
We're not doing anybody any favors by making their wrong conduct right. Don't rejoice in iniquity. Don't take a joy in what people do that are wrong. This morning, we appreciate that we have a pure and wholesome love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves us. He cares about us. He cares about your soul. He cares about your life. Today, I wish you would respond to his great love. I think all of the obedience to the gospel, in essence, is responding to the love that's the purest love of all. This lesson hasn't even mentioned the word agape, which is how the word Greek, the Greek word for love in all of this text throughout 1 Corinthians. But we need to understand that's his kind of love. He loved when you weren't lovely. He loved when you weren't good. He didn't say you were right when you were wrong, but he died for you when you were wrong. And he'll live for you to help make you right. Today, if you need to come and be baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of your faith and confession and repentance, we would receive you and help you obey the Lord in baptism. If you need to be restored, we will pray with you. While we stand and sing, you are invited to come.